Hello, I'm Scott Santens, and I'm joined here by Conrad Shaw and Josh Worth, my co-hosts, and this is the Basic Income Show. This intro music is AI-generated, love it or hate it, no one was compensated. One more artist, one is where their money will come from. One more example of the need for basic income. Yeah, hello everybody. This week, lots to talk about as always, but today, first of all, something big's going on over up in up in Canada, our neighbor to the north, and um, they've got a basic income bill that has uh, gone through two readings, and um, you know this has been a process over like two years at this point or at least approaching two years, and they will be uh, voting on it today at 3 p.m. So I thought it'd be good just to make sure everybody knows about that and uh, also just to cover a little bit about it because, you know, as always with something like this, there's plenty of misinformation out there. I thought it'd be good to cover what it actually is and what it isn't. Okay, so this is... uh, The Bill S-233 and Bill C-233 are um, both like essentially the the same bill. And, um, you know, just one is is in the Senate and one is in their, you know, House. What it would do is develop a national framework for what they're calling a guaranteed livable basic income. So, yeah, part of the, the misinformation out there is that this would actually implement a basic income like immediately. And of course, that's not the case. What it would do is basically result in a report being done. They would need to, you know, look into how best to go about implementing a a basic income in Canada and uh, a year after the report would be due. Or is it a report that uh, proposes an actual policy and a program? Or is it just, is this, are they voting on, should we even start thinking about this, essentially? So it's just a report. But here we can like go into the actual just wording even, just so people know exactly what this says. Yeah, here's the preamble. Whereas every person should have access to a livable basic income, whereas the provision of a guaranteed livable basic income would go a long way toward eradicating poverty and improving income equality, health conditions, and educational outcomes, whereas the provision of a guaranteed livable basic income would benefit individuals, families, and communities and protect those who are made most vulnerable in society while facilitating the transition to an economy that responds to the climate crisis and other current major challenges. And whereas a guaranteed livable basic income program implemented through a national framework would ensure the respect, dignity, and security of all persons in Canada. Now, therefore, uh, Her Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons of Canada, and act as follows. I mean, one of the first question I have is, what's their definition of a guaranteed livable basic income? Like, is it universal? Is it tar- is it targeted? And how? What does livable mean? That's always a sort of a flag of like some some people use the term livable to say it needs to be you know like um, a middle class salary size. Um, yeah. So, are you do you know if that's in here? Well, so again, there's really nothing in here in regards to numbers, but it does point out like there is like a sufficiency kind of aspect to this. And so, you know, there can be debate over what that is. But in general, Canada isn't talking about a fully universal basic income. And, you know, even when they refer to it as basic income, you know, that doesn't meet the definition of basic income because it is means tested. It's essentially a negative income tax is what they would do there, which is also referred to as like a basic income guarantee. 
And then so the guaranteed livable base income part, the livable is, as you said, something about, you know, sufficiency. So whereas, you know, the definition of basic income, a $100 per month basic income can be a basic income when in Canada, they're talking about a livable basic income. They're specifically talking about, you know, something needs to be around $2,000 per month or something in order to be considered livable. But again, this is just a framework for this. So um, here's some, some more of what it says. In developing the framework, the minister must consult with the minister of health, the minister is responsible for employment, social development, and disability, representatives of the provincial governments responsible for health, disability, education, and social development, indigenous elders, indigenous governing bodies, and other relevant stakeholders, including policy developers and political decision makers, as well as experts in other guaranteed livable basic income programs. So part of this is that it's not just like one person coming up with this, you know, they're, they're looking to take down the silos and figure out what would be a good implementation um, by doing this in a more of an integrated way with other departments and stuff. The framework must include measures, and then there's these different things has to include, uh, to determine what constitutes a livable basic income for each region in Canada, taking into account the goods and services that are necessary to ensure that individuals can lead a dignified and healthy life, as well as the cost of those goods and services in accessible markets. So that's the sufficiency kind of thing, where it's up to the people writing the report to essentially recommend what the amount should be in each region in Canada. So it can even, you know, vary by region, uh, according to, you know, this language. And it needs to create national standards for health and social supports that complement a guaranteed basic income program and guide the implementation of a program in every province. It needs to ensure that participation in education, training, or the labor market is not required in order to qualify for guaranteed livable basic income. So that is the, you know, no work requirements. That's the unconditional aspect of this. And um, it needs to ensure that the implementation of a guaranteed level basic income program does not result in a decrease in services or benefits meant to meet an individual's exceptional needs related to health or disability. So then that language is saying that it needs to be additional, especially when it comes to those with disabilities and it shouldn't like replace say healthcare, you know, that kind of right. thing. I kind of like putting it that way too. Cause when people, uh, ask like what program should it replace, people tend to lump <clears throat> all benefits in the same, like, do you want to replace our right. current welfare system? And I'm always like anything that's punitive and, and can be better done with cash should be replaced, but things that represent extra, extra costs of people in certain s circumstances like healthcare and disability should not. So I'm glad that they're, already working that in as because because it leaves the door open to saying yeah there yeah. are certain forms of wealth care or of welfare sorry i kind of like that word wealth care i went seems like we should use that somewhere <laughs> did i say wealth, wealth care. care or wealth wealth care <laughs> i heard wealth yeah. care and it just got me thinking of what i wonder what wealth care is yeah maybe that's the new term maybe for it's... ubi that we should go <laughs> everyone's always like right you need a new word for UBI. That's the problem. Like, <laughs> you need to call it my thing. It's like, dude, we've tried that. But wealth care. Yeah. But then healthcare right. and wealth yeah. care. Wealth, which I think people do a pretty good job of that already. <laughs> right. Like if you're if you're rich, if you're rich, you're healthier. Yeah. So um, you know, wealth care is a form of, of medicine, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Wealth? So uh yeah, mm -hmm. next up. The tabling framework. Okay, so within one year after the day in which this act comes into force, the minister must prepare a report setting out the framework, including any social, health, and economic conclusions and recommendations related to its development, and cause the report to be tabled in each House of Parliament on any of the first 15 days in which the House is sitting after the report is completed. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the meat of it, right? here is that it, there's one year for a report and they need to figure out, okay, taking the, you know, economic implications into account and health and everything else, 
what do we recommend as a way of implementing this in Canada? And then the report can't just sit there. The report has to be tabled into Parliament. So like they need to discuss it, the report after it's done. So tabling here means the opposite of what I'm used to it meaning. Like when you table something, it means you're putting it off. But here it means table <clears throat> means you're putting it on the table. Like we have to talk yeah. about this. Okay. Yeah, it is a little bit confusing. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's my understanding of how it works in Canada. Hmm. And then uh, let's see. So then within two years after the report referred to in Section 4 has been tabled in both Houses of Parliament, and every year after that, the minister must, in consultation with the parties referred to in subsection three, undertake a review of the effectiveness of the framework, prepare a report setting out the social health and economic findings and recommendations related to the implementation and effectiveness of the framework, and cause the report to be tabled in each House of Parliament at any of the first 15 days in which that House is sitting after it was completed. So it is my understanding from this that then there's like a second layer so that not only does this report get tabled in parliament needs to be discussed but then two years after the report has been tabled then there needs to be like another consultation and report or something about that framework report so it's it's really meant to like keep this going to be like hey this is what we found now we thought about it some more and we think it should be this. Do we want to enact basic income yet? So it's really meant to like kind of keep this going in Canada in, is there, until so like now, be implemented. So now we're three years down the road and we're trying to keep the conversation going, but there's no like that I've seen yet uh, commitments to a deadline to put together an actual proposal to do a basic income and decide on that. Um, is that which is one of the things I keep looking for as I try to figure out, you know, in this world of politics and Canadian is politics is even more far away from me. Is this a punt? Are, are we, are we actually tabling this in the, you know, the way that I understand it sense? Is this a way to make people happy that it's being considered while buying or stalling for three years before then we're all like, okay, it's been three years. Are, are we going to put together an actual bill? Are we going to, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to think about that because it's, I don't know. Foreign I see me. that as like kind of like a backup plan, you know, where, where this is a kind of foot in the door where, you know, Canada is not there yet to be like voting for a basic income. You know, like if there was a bill there to actually pass it, it wouldn't pass. So then this bill is meant to actually get to that point where, you know, there's like serious thought put into what does this look like in Canada? And then the various parties can kind of mobilize around whatever version, you know, it's either that it comes out or they debate on and how they think that it should be different or whatever. But then, you know, after that report hits, maybe that's enough to kind of push this to actually get it implemented in Canada. And maybe not, but then they already have to discuss it again, you know, another year after that or whatever. So even if it doesn't, even if it fails to get some bill going, then it's not just like buried and then they never talk about it again. Like they do need to talk about it again, you know, a year after that. So I think, I think it's a good, you know, interesting way of going about it to kind of keep it alive. Like it would be interesting if Congress had to discuss Andrew Yang's freedom dividend you know, instead of just completely ignoring that a presidential candidate actually like ran on basic income, you know, like, I don't know, I think that's helpful. But this bill is the one they're talking about right now, their vote, whether or not to adopt this bill that we're looking at. Yeah, that's what they're, this bill is what they're voting on today for the report. Yeah. I wonder, you know, first of all, I'm curious how they're going to vote. I wonder if this goes through, what sort of a commitment does it <clears throat> mean like financially like how much of the budget has to go in how much how seriously do they need to research this and consider it and, and who would be hired on to do it is it something this is it like some some dude is going to go poke around on the internet for a little while to satisfy you know the needs of this bill or are they going to have like a, a team fully committed to research on this for the next year well the order is for the 
with the finance minister to develop the framework. And so the, uh, and the finance minister needs to consult with the minister of health. So then, you know, there's, I don't know if there's other ministers involved too. I think it's just the main ministers, but you know, I'm sure the finance minister would need to put together, yeah, some kind of expert team of some kind to create the report in Canada. I'm curious how they feel about it on the inside. Uh, who is that? We brought Jia Ying on at that one, at one point, maybe we should bring her back. But, um, like what's the inside scoop on like, are th these finance and health ministers, like, do we know if they're excited about this or if it's like, oh crap, there's another thing I got to do to show that I'm doing my job. Yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> As with everything, there's people who dislike it and, and like it, but in Canada, there certain seems to be a lot more cross-partisan support, especially depending on the region. So uh, what is it? I think it's Prince Edward Island is the place where like every party there has expressed support for uh, doing something there. It could be a pilot or because it's kind of a smaller location, just be like the first to do it. Uh, it's interesting to see that it just seems to be a lot more cross-partisan there. It makes me think as an American advocate and what we're working on in in the context of them doing this research and taking it more seriously, what can we try to do right to help influence how they think about things? You know, can like they we've got three years, for example, to get commingle running and scalable enough to influence like how people think about what basic income even is and and uh, ways to deliver it and stuff like that. They've got all the pilots that are running in the U.S. to use for their data so they don't actually have to be like conducting all of their own research and coming up with the money to do that in a way so we they're being helped by the u.s in that way they're able to like kind of collect that info and use it as an argument study being done they're not going to be that yeah that is also one of the things that kind of concerns me is that uh so many of our pilots are sort of running on the same premises uh, it go goes along with the guaranteed livable basic income sort of move away from universality i wonder if there's a a door in that window of research for them to come to you know the benefits of and of universality um mm -hmm. and that's where i think like the stuff we're doing can can help push a needle for others if we find a way to actually demonstrate it but as far as a, a national version like this is probably about as close as any of our North American neighbors have come up with. So like, it's, it seems like maybe they are looking at the research we're doing and saying, uh, Hey, look, it works. Let's, uh, let's try this. And at least it's like, they're, they're putting the, they're, they're tabling the idea of putting it on the table, which is more. Yeah, no, they're, at least they're, they're seriously discussing it. I mean, they've got a, they got a bill there and it's, it's a serious discussion enough that you know, you've got this misinformation there. There was uh, someone in, you know, parliament there in Canada talking about this. And I mean, there was just so much misinformation being spread that she had to like speak in front of, you know, parliament and, and really like debunk a lot of these things. It's just like crazy things being written, um, you know, to her office. And so she just had to, you know, stand up and say something about it. In Canada, it, like most of the misinformation I've seen is, is, uh, aside from saying that this would implement a basic income, you know, immediately saying stuff like, oh, well, it's going to, um, you know, force you to get vaccinated and it's, um, you know, they're, they're looking to create dependency and, and control you. They're going to, to give you this basic income and then freeze your, freeze your basic income, freeze your bank account, whatever, if they don't like what you're doing, like all this nonsense that of mm -hmm. course, you know, is not in the bill. It is not what basic income is, uh, but it's out there. And I don't know, at least that they're, at least they're doing something like this. Like we're not even discussing this in, in our Congress, you know, did they're a uh, stimulus during the pandemic. Like we did. Yeah, they did something called the uh, CERB, and that was uh, was two thousand dollars per month, and it was it was kind of it, it was more like our unemployment boost, but it but it 
it also was kind of like our stimulus just because, uh, you know, like it just went to like more people. Uh, but also it was like, it was very, it was much more like unemployment in that you, you know, lost it for getting a job. And, and then the, like, it like if you, something about $1,500 or like, if you, like if you, oh yeah. So like, if you, if you got a job that was paying $1,500 per month, then, you know, you would, you would lose this. And of course it was giving you $2,000 per month. So, you know, there was just all the reason in the world to not accept these jobs. Right. That's what I'm talking about is I'm worried and we'll wait three years and they'll come out with another version of the same sort of thing that uh, other other similar things have come out with that act as disincentivizing welfare type programs. We've got this guy on Twitter, actually, um, who's speaking for Canada, Tom, the B.I. Vic guy, PC oh, okay. guy. So he's got a couple little bits of info. PEI, uh, that's the Prince Edward Island, is meant to be a demonstration project. So instead of a pilot, it's like it's really going for it. Right. Um, he says, with federal funding, adjusting as it goes, and if, and if successful, a rollout. And then he says, um, Senator Pauline Simons came out not so much defending it, but addressing misinformation. It's cool to hear about uh, politicians actually, you know, dipping their toes in more than to just kind of uh, tepidly mention that it's an interesting idea, you know. So, um, but, you know, addressing misinformation, for one thing, is, is further than I've seen most American politicians go. Yeah. And uh, again, this is this should be taking place in like a half hour. Tom, the, bi the Bivik Bic guy, keeps responding. This is fun. He says, I'm waiting too, LOL. Uh, just out of curiosity, what does Bivik Bic stand for? Basic Income <laughs> Victoria, British Columbia, I'm guessing? It's a good guess. That doesn't, it doesn't ring quite as well as the UBI guy, but I guess that was already <laughs> taken. Not everyone could be that cool. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know. It's since we're, we're, we're kind of talking about misinformation and stuff, do you want to watch a, a quick misinformation-filled the video but yeah those are fun like, the best yeah. I tell you, I, so you should maybe lead off with those because they're the most funny and then the people will listen to us talk and, like <laughs> what like read through bill that's going through some sort of governmental congress like new people yeah. coming will be yeah. like what is this yeah i suppose that was a not the most exciting way to start the video it was, was exciting it, to me very interesting to me very interesting to tom i, I know probably 50 people uh who would be <laughs> like that's the most interesting thing going on in ubi Nobody who's not into UBI. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for those who don't know, do you know the, the last, the last show that we did, we covered this ridiculous anti-UBI video from a channel with 2.5 million subscribers and, you know, had a ton of views. And so, I don't know, it's fun to, to at least kind of uplift us, see what is being said about basic income in a, in a negative way and just go through and, and, you know, properly inform people. This is, uh, Brett Weinstein did, uh, this little seven minute video, um, on another channel, just some things said that are correct and some things said that are entirely wrong. And it always kinds to be the the seed of, of misinformation is that, you know, it's not like it's always a hundred percent incorrect. Um, but there's some leaps of assumptions made, uh, a lot of the time. Turmoil for whatever reason. Um, Sam Altman's other business called Wildcoin intends to, I think it intends to distribute basically value. Let's just to simplify it, distribute money to people in a world where there's been so much economic disruption that we've kind of lost our jobs. That's kind of how I understood it. So people are going around the world scanning their retinas and these machines that have been placed all over the world. And that's going to become the mechanism to identify you as a unique individual, as a, as a, as a human, so that they can send you free money, universal basic income in a world where people are going to struggle to have jobs. Now, I, I think I've, I don't think I've butchered that too much, but do you believe that world is going to happen where there's going to be so much disruption in the labor force that so many people are going to be unemployed that we're going to need to just basically give out money to people. I think that's going to be a short ride. You think it's going to be a short ride? Yeah, I do. What do you mean by that? Unfortunately, the story of human evolution and competition 
is it's one of great triumph and overcoming adversity in some chapters, and it's one of uh, tragedy and atrocity in others. I am very concerned that the idea of useless eaters is about to make a huge comeback and that UBI has two impacts. UBI meaning universal basic income. Universal basic income and everything that functions like it, you know, so some distribution of value. One, it's going to make the people. Okay, so just there, he just equated universal basic income to like anything that distributes value. Right. I am assuming that he thinks welfare is basic income, that um, any kind of like benefit in kind is basic income. Like he's just saying, if you basically help people who need help, there's problems with that. People who are creating the value or people who think they're creating the value resent those who are absorbing the value just to live. And it is therefore going to trigger a quest to reduce that line item on the balance sheet. And there will be all kinds of excuse making, but um, it's pretty, it, it's pretty ugly. I mean, we see that in society already, people that are working hard and that are paying a lot of tax get resentful towards the people at the very bottom of the income spectrum who are maybe not um, working at all and are getting paid. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I, and interestingly, another factor in here is people that earn more money seem to have less kids. And that becomes a point of contention in society. Yep. Uh, so I think you're seeing the picture and you're... Okay, so there, when the host said that, you know, when you earn more money, you, you have less kids, um, there's actually like a shape to that when it comes to uh, fer fertility rates and where you have more kids if you have lower income. And then as your income increases, you have less kids. And then you have more kids uh, when you can afford to have more kids. So like in general, uh, you know, it is true to say that like as part of becoming a develop developed economy, that your fertility rates uh, go down in those economies, but also at like an indiv individual household level. Uh, it's also true to say that, that there's a lot of families out there or a lot of couples out there that would like to uh, start a family, have a family or grow their family that simply can afford to. And so, you know, it's, it's for those who actually believe that it's important to increase fertility rates, then basic income can actually be helpful in that. But then also where they're, they're kind of talking about like this, uh, you know, the resentfulness of those who let's say pay for basic income uh, even though it's not really how it works, but let's say, you know, that he, it's the quote unquote robbing Peter to pay Paul. It reminds me of that in one of the, in the, in the Canadian uh, uh, Dauphin Manitoba experiment, there was no stigma in that because it was, it, it was a, a saturation site pilot, you know, the entire town got this. And then, so they're, they're actually, there was no stigma from that. Uh, same thing in Alaska with full universality and in this belief that you receive this dividend because you are owed a share of the natural wealth of Alaska. So, of course, that's part of it, too. Yeah, this is just coming out of the beginning premise that they launched off of, which is that UBI is exactly equivalent to every other sort of welfare program. And that's where he's getting his logic that then we'll have the whole, you know, welfare queen, useless eaters sort of debate again. And people will be resentful because he's not understanding or he's not being or he's being disingenuous about his understanding right. of, of what UBI actually is. Um, and then about the, the, the fertility rates thing, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, too, uh, 
people don't often seem to talk about what's lost in the averages as well. Like if, if people more often um, or have fewer kids on the, the, the larger average scale as they move up the income spectrum, but more families are able to have kids. What does that mean as well? Like a diversity of like number of families that children are coming from, uh, even if populations decline or the number of total kids declines is interesting to me. I do know, including myself, a lot of people who had to put up having kids for a very long time because we couldn't financially um, justify it. Uh, and that's truer and truer for many more people. It's like it takes well into your 30s to establish yourself and start a career and feel comfortable. You can't, you know, far fewer people can afford a house, can afford to have one parent stay at home, all of that stuff um, makes it a, a more difficult decision to try to have a kid, even if you are a conscientious, good citizen, want to be a good parent. Yeah, the it's, whole it's thing a good is point like, to raise about the, the age, too. No, go ahead. Yeah, it's just starting to trickle into that, like, eugenics kind of thing. Every time you start talking about, like, you know, bloody rates of the poor versus the rich, it's like, you're just right. like getting into some really kind of like anti-humanitarian type of thinking. Like, yeah, I don't care how right you are. You're still being a jackass. Like, <laughs> like we're still like yeah, the facts add up, but you're still the underlying message is that some people is lives are worth more than others. Right. And it's just kind of, it's, it's there in this whole kind of intellectual discussion that you can feel it just kind of creeping up like it did in the last one. I'm not too optimistic for the rest of this video just based <laughs> on the, the very simple premise they started with. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 I, did, I wanted to add too, just um, before we go on, that it, it is interesting about the um, about the ages that, that go into this too, because I've noticed that one of the observations from like basic income pilots and, and unconditional cash programs too uh, is the observation of like a delay from teenage births to later on in life. So, you know, it's not to say that a woman will or will not give birth because of a lack of basic income. It's that, you know, if they're, if they don't have basic income, then what they do do often is let's say engage in, in sex work or their parents like marry them off or whatever. And then, so they have a kid in their teens Whereas if they have a basic income, then they're less likely to engage in sex work and they're less likely to be, you know, sold off by their parents, in which case they have kids in like their 20s or 30s. And I, I think, you know, part of this should be just the, the freedom to decide not only if you have a kid, yeah, but when you have a kid. Okay. You're exactly, you're exactly understanding why this will turn into uh, the usual demonization of some set of people uh, as a pretext for getting rid of them. So that's bad. The other bad. Of <laughs> which, which, which set of people is he talking about? I mean, it's like he's talking about the people who are getting a basic income, mm -hmm. which is misunderstanding basic income. At least he said it. Well, was and bad. also he's, he, he, he He's doing that useless eater stuff again, and he, and he already used that phrase earlier. So it does function as like this this kind of like dog whistle kind of impact where uh, you say useless eater, and what he's saying is that there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there who who love Brett Weinstein, by the way. He's like, he's gotten very big in conspiracy circles. Um, you know, they believe that there's this conspiracy of the rich like Bill Gates and others to reduce the population through, you know, like vaccines that kill people so they believe that the covid vaccine was actually meant to kill a bunch of people and depopulate the earth and then others believe that covid was this disease this virus to depopulate the earth but a lot of them believe that because there's going to be so many like useless eaters that you have to kill them off that there's there's no other you know there's why would you want to provide a basic income to these people when like, you know, the billionaires of the world would prefer that they just not exist at all. So he's like saying that this feeds into this, that that is what's going to happen, you know? 
he's kind I of mean, using it as like defense thing. It's the general philosophy uh, of people against any sort of social support for anyone. It's not often expressed out loud because that would be called out, but the implication by we shouldn't help you. And if you don't figure it out and you know, lift yourself up by your bootstraps, it's your fault. Like the implication is you deserve to die. You deserve to starve. One of the basic questions of, you know, if you're, you're trying to be blunt about the philosophy of basic income is even if someone is lazy or whatever, do they deserve to die? Is that a, is that punishable by death? uh in the society or or not and it, the implica implication of not helping someone re regardless of whatever their circumstances is to live a, a basic level dignified life or or however you want to determine it is that if you don't do that then you're saying uh there that something like laziness uh should come with a death sentence yeah and i think he's even saying that that because basic income will make people lazy, which it won't, but he's saying that it will, in which case you'll have a bunch of people who are doing lots of stuff and they're going to look at the people not doing anything and be like, well, why are we working for them? Why are we giving money to them when they're not doing anything? In which case, let's kill them. So then his kind of, his argument, I think, against basic income is saying that if we do that, then that will happen. And if we don't, but if we don't do that, then that won't happen because they're not getting anything. But of course, the implication of that is that then they'll starve and they'll, they'll die anyways. So it's just, it's, it's weird. It's a win-win for It's him. a weird argument. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would love to live in a world where the punishment for laziness or whatever is, you know, your life is pretty boring. Not that you're sleeping on the streets or whatever. And that's what people misunderstand is that it's not really very fun to just sit in your apartment all day watching Netflix for the entirety of your life. And nobody will actually want to do that. I was being interviewed by a guy recently. Uh, maybe it'll come out in the next uh, little while. But a conservative uh, journalist was trying to, you know, hit me with some gotcha questions or was trying to like, um, call me out. And he said, uh, you know, if I had a basic income, you know, all through my twenties or whatever, or now I, I wouldn't, I would never get out of bed. And I just said, I don't believe you. <laughs> yes, you would. Like you're not doing this. He even said something like, I'm, I only do this. The only time reason I do any, any work is because if I didn't, I would starve. And it's like, that's, I was glad he just said it out loud. Cause it's often the implication, but it's like, I, right. I don't believe you. I think you got more rattling around in there in terms of desire for purpose and legacy and like just having fun while you're on this earth as does yeah. everybody. But the really funny thing to me about that too, is that he's on social security. So like he's receiving social security payments and he's, he's a journalist. So like he's earning, who knows what his income is, but he's got a social security too. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do this. Yeah. We haven't named him yet. And I, I, don't, I don't know what the piece is going to be like, but it was it was a fun experience uh and um it seems like e even people who are classically right wing are are coming around to taking the idea seriously enough which is a good sign to to want to to want to hold a, a decent interview yeah yeah and one of, one of my things um that has frustrated me in the last you know handful of years is that when i first came into ubi i really enjoyed talking with libertarians and conservatives and things like that uh, among my friends and among the, you know, just people I would run into because it was so much easier than any other political topic. You know, I could get immediate agreement from a lot of people on it because I came to it as sort of like a, just a human empowerment thing, not, uh, not the way it's sort of been taken as like, we need to help the neediest of the needy, which does kind of like, trigger these dog whistles for you know, these, well, you mean useless eaters who are going to, you know, use the government force to steal my hard earned income to give to someone who didn't deserve it. Like that doesn't need to be part of the argument. It doesn't have to be. And I feel like uh, it's been, it's been propped up by, you know, the movement in general leaning into this sort of more paternalistic elitism rather than like a, you know, fuck you, I got mine elitism. But they're both, they both end up with the same sort of uh, 
disdainful view looking down at those who aren't as you know successful in society for whatever reason i think it, i think a lot changed with covid where um i think the the libertarians they were part of the group about like no shutdowns no vaccine mandates and that kind of thing and then you have the anti-vaxxers who were no vaccine mandates and all that stuff and then they just combined and i just think there, there's more of that it became more of this intermingling and intermixing between libertarians and anti-vaxxers and this giant conspiracy QAnon community stuff and uh, yeah i think brett weinstein is one of those that that went into that community and his you know is a favorite of that community and it just kind of as you said it's 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 a shame because it's a very libertarian idea and so it's it's a you know, it's weird to see, um, you know, libertarians use weird arguments against it. Come from UBI is learned helplessness. And I think we've actually seen this. In fact, the woke revolution, I think. It <laughs> okay. I know it's already, it's just, he just said woke revolution and learned helplessness is in like basic income will increase learned helplessness. And uh, I've written an article about this before, about um, you know the impacts of, of like stress and the importance of basic income reduce, in reducing stress, and how it reduces learned helplessness. Like it, it's it is actually the opposite. Like he's just saying that he's making these assumptions, but basic income is, is empowering. It enables people to have more choices, to make more decisions, to choose the way that they want to live, to actually have more of an impact in their communities and in their own lives. Yeah. And learned helplessness means the more you fail at something, the less you do at something, the more help you get. And so it's like a positive reinforcement on a negative behavior where that's exactly how a lot of our welfare programs work. And they sort of force people. It's like a taught helplessness. Whereas the people in the pilots who, and um, who are on basic income who have the most rewarding experience are the ones who use that as a floor with which to pursue their higher aspirations. And that's what they do. It, it acts, it acts that way. It's sort of like learned confidence. It's learned empowerment and it's learned risk tolerance. And that's the sort of things you see when it plays out in practice. It's like, these are, it's like giving an allowance to a kid as, as far as that metaphor will stretch is a little bit problematic, but um, it's, it's, it's learning how to use money. It's learning how to uh, invest wisely. It's learning how to pursue the things you care about. Uh, and that's what that frees up. Yeah, it's learning. <laughs> and yeah, you should be able to make mistakes. But yeah, this learned helplessness, I, I hate that uh, that he even brought that up as, as something. It's a tragic story because on the one hand, while you know I was chased out of a job that I loved by a bunch of people who accused me of things that I wasn't guilty of in a kind of madness. On the other hand, how did they end up there? They ended up there because they were betrayed. They were betrayed by a system that was supposed to deliver them a life that worked. It was, you know, if you did what you were asked to do, if you went to school, if you did the homework, you were supposed to come out of it with a skill set that would allow you to live a decent life. And instead, they were given, many of them were given drugs that we biologically had no understanding of. You know? Okay. So he's going to go further down this, this uh, I don't know, rabbit hole. But I just want to point out that this is one of those things where there's a, there's a partial truth to this, I feel, where it's kind of like the mere of it where he's he's saying that essentially there were people who were lied to they um you know they went to college and they you know they tried to get um you know some kind of degree or whatever and they hoped that their lives would go a certain way after doing that you know like the achievement of the american dream they didn't achieve that american dream and so now they're they're looking to attack others or whatever because of that. And then he's saying that, that they, that he's a victim of that. Like, so he's saying that the kind of like this, this failure to achieve their, 
their economic like dreams led to them to become woke and attack him and others like him. And I think the the seed of truth to this is that that there that there is a failure w- with this American dream that we have, where we have decades of deindustrialization, where people have been impacted. Although it's mostly those who have not gone to college, and then so if you it's in these cored out industrial towns where they had good jobs despite having just high school degrees, and now they earn a lot less because um, they weren't able to to find these better jobs. So they're kind of like left behind, they're fallen behind. And those are the ones who I feel are actually the ones falling for this woke culture stuff. And they're the anti-woke and they're getting mad at the wokesters. That old playbook is like, get when, when shit is bad for people, point to someone they can blame it on. Right. Uh, and that's, that's what you need to do to to distract from it being a systemic issue or an unfairness thing. It's like point to the bad guy. We have a couple of comments in the chat that are kind of funny. Uh, GFZ says being enslaved to a job market is learned helplessness, which is a funny way to look at it too. It's, it mm-hmm. reminds me of how, you know, like the, when in 2020, when we were, you know, hoping that democratic uh, candidates would talk more about basic income, and, you know, Joe Biden comes out there and talks, you know, the usual talk about how you get dignity from a job. But I, I've never understood if you absolutely are required to work a job or stick with your job for your health care and your wage, then you're not doing it for dignity. You're doing it to avoid pain. That's not dignified. That's 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 fear based behavior. Dignified is when it is when you're doing yeah. it because you care about it. And um, John Wisdom says, if you aren't struggling for a wage, are you even living? And then felt the need to say, I'm being sarcastic, obviously, in another comment where it's like, it's funny that you need to, in this day and age, it makes sense that someone would feel the need to say that they're being sarcastic. You know, it's like, there's so much, uh, there's so much weird rhetoric around, you know, the the purpose of people and work that, some, you know, that's the kind of stuff yeah, you see I mean, on Twitter. <clears throat> it's a pretty good example of kind of like what the thing here, he kind of is saying, if you're not struggling for a wage, you're not even living and you're maybe not even worth living. Like, I know it's not like, he's not stating this, he's coming at it from like multiple directions, but it is like, there is this underlying uh, superiority that is, there's a, there's a hierarchy in the mind of this argument, of the people making this argument, right? And it is that right. they're making the argument is obviously at the top of the hierarchy of superiority, right? Like, it's just this underlying need for superiority that's in there that you can, I, I think that's actually like the most revolutionary thing about the UBI, the idea is that it's like, it forces you to scrap that idea of, superiority and social hierarchy and and just acknowledge that at a certain level everybody should have a certain amount of money to live right and then you do whatever you want to do with it right and then i'll start judging you for your behavior but like you know <laughs> right that there's that there's some amount of e- of equality that should be shared and you can still yeah. have a hierarchy on top of that equality you know we always talk about it as a floor or a foundation mm-hmm. and yeah you can you can still, you're still going to have inequality. You're still going to have rich. You're still going to have the middle class and everything. But yeah, just, just there's going to be no one who's starving and homeless. Right. But just the uh, the introducing of that idea, uh, there is some level of inequality, kind of is a threat to a certain worldview, I think, that says that this inequality uh, at the top is the structure, underlying structure of society right and as soon as you try to tinker with yeah. that the whole thing's going to topple over right and you can just sort of feel that in this argument here right we haven't we haven't gotten away through it yet but yeah <laughs> somebody was profiting off their dependency and we sent them to schools and we provided them with majors that they could dedicate themselves to that weren't real that didn't create skills or insight in many cases created exactly the inverse it created confusion and at some point they realize you know what i don't have a plan and in such a case those people who don't have skills that are going to allow them to live a decent life are going to look for someone to blame and they're probably going to land on the wrong person right 
And especially if somebody is cynically willing to sell them the story that you know who you should blame, it's straight white guys or something like that, they'll listen. Okay. So this is, again, like, it's it's such a weird, like, mirror of reality where he's saying that people go to college and they they learn useless skills and then they come out of that and they feel angry and then so they get mad at white men like that's whereas like the reality is that people for the most part it's those who don't go to college who find it way too hard to achieve the american dream and they get mad at other people but those are immigrants those are those are black people those are lgbtq people like those are the ones being othered this idea that like it's it's white men being othered because of like the learned helplessness of people graduating from college like that's weird to me that's like a it's a weird argument and I wonder how it would land on, you know, blue collar white men that are, I think, a big percent of percentage of his audience, I would assume, you know, and it's like, well, do they realize, well, I'm mad, too, because shit has been harder and harder for me. And you described, you know, not me just now. Um, who who do they get to get mad at? Or is this sort of inviting them into the fold and saying, actually, you're a successful you're a successful white man. It's just the problem is, you know, these wokesters being mad have dragged you down. Like they're trying to, they're trying to. I mean, to, it uh, seems like that's where we're, that's where this argument is headed is it's like people uh, lazy and don't have anything better to do are just going to start blaming the white man because they are lazy <laughs> and don't have anything better to do, which is and like, hmm, right. Okay. Yeah. And now they want to introduce this thing that means you're going to get taxed and all your success is going to be limited. And it's right. like, well, yes. uh, there's a lot of salaries out there for people working really hard that even if they weren't taxed at all, things would be tough right now. Like with uh, wages stagnating for the last 50 years. And um, that's the that's the big elephant in the room is that it doesn't really matter your demographic if you're not in the top 10 percent. Things have gotten harder and and just progressively harder. It's just like taking people within that bottom 90 or the bottom 50 and pointing their rage at each other. And it works. It's worked for a long time. But it's it's weird, too, there, that there is this educational polarization going on. And I, I included that chart um, as, as part of our, our previous uh, show where, you know, if you look at those who have college educations – you don't see these this huge growth and deaths of despair with those. It's, it's it's with men and women who haven't graduated from college that you see these deaths of despair growing at really scary rates over decades. And it's especially men. So men are the ones doing the absolute worst. High school, or they don't even graduate high school, it's non-college educated men are the ones where you're seeing all these deaths of despair. And he's making it sound like if you, it's the problem is from people going to college that that they're the ones that are are really having a hard time. I wonder if he, how long it is until he starts talking about the elites while looking down his nose at right. a big percentage right, yeah. of the country. Maybe we should turn these well, into a drinking game where it's like as yeah, they build into elite. their argument, it's like we have or a bingo card, you know, oh, elites, <laughs> useless eaters. Okay, uh, bingo. Yeah. All right, let's see if it finishes off. I will say, uh, I've done a lot of thinking um, about Are the you sure? theory of human competition. And one thing has struck me in recent years, which is that there's a reason that communism continues oh. to reemerge. It doesn't work. Bingo. So why yeah. would people keep landing there? And I think it is unfortunately the natural consequence of a, a meritocracy that does not take care of those who lose. Ah, see? If you have a meritocracy where the way to have a decent life is to figure out how to provide something that people want, right? But you don't have a plan for the people who try that and it doesn't work for whatever reason. 
then what you will end up with is a large number of people who will correctly understand that they are on the losing end of a bargain. Those people don't have an investment in keeping that system running. See, and this is where this is that seed of truth that but I this feel. This is the where, case for UBI. Like, that is, he's right. making it. Yeah, he can't wait until he I, says. Therefore, hear the shocking truth part about it. Is this the shocking truth? The shocking truth is it's a good idea. Is that? <laughs> I mean, I use that all the time when I'm talking to conservatives, especially yeah. that are concerned with accountability and people really in reciprocity and all that stuff. Is like, you can't. You can't clamor for accountability in a system that doesn't have accountability to its people. You have to lead with trust in order to have accountability because as, as soon as I can point, you know, you can point to someone who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps or got out of the ghetto or whatever, like a, a someone in, a, in, in an inspiring story. But I can point to millions of people who are also inspiring as people that just got the, the shit kicked out of them by our society. And if that possibility exists, you don't have a leg to stand on. That's the premise for why we need a basic income so that there is a floor beneath which you can't fall that anyone can, you know, keep building on top of or not falling below. All right. Let's see where he goes. Let's see if uh, he lands on the shocking truth is that we should have basic income. <laughs> All right. They want to oh overturn it. In fact, with some cause, they will look at all of the fortunes that have been created in that meritocracy and they will say do you realize how much of that is illegitimate do you realize how much of that was parasitic we want it back and so i think communism is you know game theoretically it can't be made to work it has a fundamental flaw at its heart which is that it punishes those who contribute and it rewards those who don't such a system will inherently be unproductive if you love the <laughs> I didn't catch that. That was the an leak argument there. against communism, not against basic right. income. <laughs> yeah, he's that's that's the shocking truth, I guess, is that <laughs> basic income is communism. But well, he never actually catch, said that. I didn't catch the sequitur either. Like he was saying people are gonna be disillusioned in a society where you bust your ass and you can't you still can't make it. I guess I get where he's going. But yeah, then there again is the original premise where not only is UBI every other welfare program, it's also communism. I mean, it's weird for me to see an argument like that where, again, there's seeds of truth in that, where, yeah, there's a serious problem with the way capitalism has been working. And people will call this end stage capitalism and, and you'll have communists and socialists, you know, pushing against this and saying we've, you know, got to do socialism and communism and stuff. But like... It's that if you have a group of people, an increasingly large and growing group of people who are disillusioned with the system because it's not working for them, then they'll push to overthrow the system. And I think that we're seeing that. That is like the rise of popularism, the populism, like both in the United States and around the world, where you've got people who are increasingly disillusioned and they're looking to overthrow the system. They're looking to, you know, throw wrenches into the machine and just say, screw this. I, I don't. I don't know what's next, but this doesn't work for me. So I'm willing to like just bet on anything that'll be better. And so, I'm willing to yeah, vote for true. Trump and, because right. what the fuck, and, why not? <laughs> and capitalists... But what we got going isn't working. Might as well like burn the whole thing down. Yeah, and, and, and capitalists, this is what I want capitalists to understand is if you like capitalism, then yeah, you should be aware that you need to make sure that capitalism works for most people. Like you want that. And that's what basic income does. Like basic income makes capitalism work for everybody because it actually is, it makes sure everybody's included in the market. It makes sure everybody can actually spend some amount of money in private markets on goods and services that they are choosing for themselves is important for the market to produce. The market actually is able to meet those demands and everyone goes, yay, capitalism is working for me. Like that is how to actually make sure capitalism is going and continues going. And then you've got people like Brett who are associating and saying essentially that that basic income is communism. And that's like the big danger is that, you know, we're going towards this 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 system where where people embrace communism. And then his weird sub argument of that is saying that the disillusionment is coming from people who are graduating from college and not from the people who are not graduating from college. Well, it's yeah, just, it's very weird. His, uh, where his, his, 
his leap of logic lost me is because he he paints this picture of a world in which people can be really working hard and not make it right and i'm on board i'm like yeah that's what i see every single day and then he says that's why we can't do communism because or or ubi which is apparently the same as communism because it will create that world and and the implication that now right. I'm catching up as to if is it that doesn't already exist, we, we, like in a horrible he's in, way right now. <laughs> right. He's a, he's implying that the meritocracy is functioning just fine right now. Mm -hmm. and it is we, until we, somebody calls him out for being kind of a jerk, right? Like, that, then maybe uh, that sign that it's not working anymore. So that, that was a good little sleight of hand because I was with him mm -hmm. and then I was confused. And it's like, oh no, he's saying, he's saying we, we are doing it right right now. Like, uh, because he's not putting forward a proposal for how to do it better. He's just saying if we will lose, you know, the fairness uh, that we have in, in our system, if we try something different. It's basically like trying something different, but in the role of a guy like him, who's the college educated white dude, who's is, you know, smarter than everybody. You don't want to do anything that might upset that little apple cart. And he's being attacked by all the wokesters, right? You know, like yes, his... That's that's what's going on. He wants to make sure we make things better so that he and other white guy elites are not attacked. You know, there's an interesting market for, you know, you know thought leaders that are sort of of this ilk who, who's that uh, have a way of presenting themselves as like highly educated prof professorial sort of in the conspiracy theorist world, because I, I think it's something that serves a niche where if you can say crazy stuff, but you can get it out there in a way that reads, you know, like intellectual. Mm -hmm. It's something yeah, that's very comfortable to lean on. Like, yo, oh, this guy just destroyed this other guy with logic and facts. Boom. And, mm -hmm. and because they have a way of, of coming across, like he's more of a, I think of a Jordan Peterson type, like a lot of gravitas and really, I think I take these things seriously and it's, mm -hmm. it's a weighty issue. And then, then there's the uh, Shapiro's of the world who just like are pretty good at stringing words together very, very quickly and confidently. Yeah, maybe maybe we could get into that space because there's like a big. I mean, we're there. close. We're three white dudes that are college educated, <laughs> <laughs> reading facts and stuff. We can we can get in there. Come on. I'm waiting for the wokesters to come yeah. after us. We we got to get some guests on our show before too long, so it's not just we're not we're not opening ourselves as much yeah. up to that. But I mean, I, there is something that, that I like listening to these arguments, like they're not dumb people. Like it, there are like using facts and like logical thinking to get from more or less one thought to the next. But like, so it does kind of like continue the conversation. But I, so, and to me, it like argument about like how um, can't, we can't devolve into this communistic way of thinking because it's going to you know, collapse capitalism is really sit well with me. Like, just because really like a universal basic income saying that you, your society can afford to have everybody live a pretty decent life. Like that is a testament to the success of the system that you've built, right? A capitalism that can also support the neediest of the needy it shows how good capitalism is, right? Like, it's like, we've got this money, we've generated this mu much wealth, we even have enough to, you know, pay for people that can't afford it, right? Like, yeah. can't afford to and survive. The, well, and the, like you see it in it, European countries have this, they're not just allowing, like the people that can't afford to live to just like, fall off into the gutters of the world, right? Like, they're pretty sophisticated systems for making sure that everybody can participate in society at some level. Yeah. That, uh, so, Solio in the chat has said something funny. Is uh, They're talking about smart people believing dumb ideas. And I think smart people are, in some, some cases, much more prone to believing ideas because they're smart enough to convince themselves of it. Like We all have a predisposition to, you know, rationalizing what we already want to believe and the smarter you are, I guess, and intellectually at forming ar arguments around something, the easier it is to trick yourself into believing something that has no real basis. Yeah, the, there was, I can't remember what this was that I was responding to, but I do remember a reply that I made to something previously just completely stupid that Brett Weinstein said. I compared it to like getting like a PhD in building a robot to actually 
push against a door that says pull. Like there's so much like there's intelligence and there's complexity, but then the output of this is just complete nonsense. He really works hard to say something really stupid. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Twitter. Michael Beck says, I spent seven years in the U.S. and I'm back to France. For sure, our system generates less, not none, violence, because we know we're not a disease away from living on the street. Yeah, that, that to me is um, one of my arguments for conservatives, kind of like what I was saying before, is about it's about accountability. You can't blame someone for being on in a, in a shitty economic situation in this country and know that you're correct. You can't. You can't say it's your fault if you're like that guy from last week's video is like you're on welfare because you're stupid, essentially, Um, because I can point to millions of people who aren't stupid or aren't lazy who are struggling. So if you create a UBI system, that's the put your money where your mouth is thing where it's like, no, there is a path. There is a path to live with dignity and live cheaply. And if you want to do better, you have to work harder. So if someone is stuck in that situation, if in a UBI world is someone is not you know, succeeding or building or, or if they're struggling to make ends meet, then it's it's actually more justifiable to then say, okay, what are you doing wrong? If there's an actual floor that you can build upon, then then where are you falling short? But now the assumption that the, the assumption of this this meritocracy actually working is that there is a path and an opportunity for everyone to to make it and build a successful life. And that's the big fallacy. Yeah. There's um, he, he, this belief that, that, um, you know, you've got the producers and you've got the, you know, those who are consuming without producing, you know, the, the makers and the takers kind of thing also reminds me of, of this that I thought would be funny to, uh, to show is just a little, little comic strip by wonder Mark. So, yeah, the, the guy says, the only thing that builds character is hard work. You should earn your rewards. No handouts. Don't give my money to some freeloader. The other guy says, I agree completely. Let's outlaw inheritance. What? The last relic of feudalism. Your parentage shouldn't determine your wealth. Everyone should start from zero so we can have a nation of people with character. Hold on. If I earn wealth, I should be able to leave it to my family. Why? To coddle them? You said it. No one deserves anything they didn't earn. I say you have until death to donate your wealth to whatever charity you like. Then once you die, anything left over goes into a nationwide student loan and medical bill repayment fund. Help your fellow citizens get up to zero so they can have a fair shot in our glorious meritocracy. Well, this is a very uh, intellectual com. It's a very intellectual comic, yeah. (laughs) Uh, I like it, the though. elites yeah, will love think this. about it for a minute but yeah I, I just whenever someone says that you know no one should eat without working just i immediately start thinking of well why don't you support the abolition of inheritance if you strongly believe in that you know That's, like that is the big elephant on the table and also <laughs> it, it opens up the conversation to what i think i've been coming around to more and more as one of the strongest arguments and or strongest impact metrics we'll see for basic income is the effect on kids. There's the, you know, that growing up not in poverty pays itself back, you know, $10, $10 to one. And one of the things I, you know, I had my complaints about the certain things Andrew Yang, when he was running, would uh, lead with. But one of the things he said that I hadn't thought of it that way before that I thought was really smart was, and it was in defending the idea that his basic income didn't give a basic income for kids, which I've always been supportive of, but he did make the point that every parent would know that starting age 18 or whatever the policy was, their kids would be getting a basic income. And so now we're, we're sort of answering this question of like, how much do you have to squirrel away to make sure your kids are always going to be safe? What percentage of parents feel like they have to like support their kids with uh, what Andy Stern would call parental basic income for, you know, the next 10 years of their life as they get started. It doesn't matter if you're upper middle class, rich, whatever, it's like everyone's right to an inheritance that gets your, you know, gets you going, gives you a shot to, to contribute. Uh, And the, the, the elephant under the, or the big elephant in the room is that a big portion of society has this to lean on, like whether it's connections or money or whatever 
through their parents and connections that other people don't have, that changes what the game looks like for for everybody playing it. It's, it's a different universe to be coming from a place where you have financial support and inheritance rather than building it up from nothing. That's why when people come to this country as immigrants, the, the historical story is, you know, the parents come, they make this enormous sacrifice, they work their asses off at terrible jobs so that they can pass on a little bit of inheritance and, and a lot of opportunity to their kids. But those parents had to sacrifice everything of theirs to put it forward to their kids, which is sort of a sort of a tragic situation uh, in general. Like everyone should be able to, to start from somewhere that lets them contribute as much as they can. You know, along those lines, I think it would be fun to go into this experiment that was like, it was a meritocracy experiment. So this was a, it was a study um, uh, out of Italy. The, the researchers stuck a large number of uh, hypothetical individuals, uh, like agents, with degrees of talent into a square world and let their lives unfold over the course of their entire work life. The defined talent is whatever set of personal characteristics allow a person to exploit lucky opportunities. Talent can include traits such as intelligence, skill, motivation, determination, creative thinking, emotional intelligence, etc. Uh, the key is that more talented people are going to be more likely to get the most bang for their buck out of a given opportunity. So all agents began the simulation with the same level of success. Uh, every six months, individuals were exposed to a certain number of lucky events and a certain amount of unlucky events. Uh, whenever a person encountered an unlucky event, their success was reduced in half. And whenever a person encountered a lucky event, their success doubled proportional to their talent. So what did they find? Uh, in the final outcome of the 40-year simulation, while talent was normally distributed, success was not. The 20 most successful individuals held 44% 44 of the total amount of success, while almost half of the population remained under 10 units of success. And talent was definitely not sufficient because the most talented individuals were rarely the most successful. In, gen in general, mediocre but lucky people were much more successful than more talented but unlucky individuals. The most successful agents tended to be those who were only slightly above average in talent, but with a lot of luck in their lives. So I think this is like a really interesting finding to me to help explain some of what of the world that we live in, where, you know, it's entirely true. You can be, you can have all the talent, but if you're unlucky, if certain events don't go your way, then you aren't going to end up like at the top. Uh, and what they found is that most people who ended up in the top are not because they had the absolute most talent. They ended up at the top because they had like enough talent and were lucky. Can you paste that link somewhere? That's uh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, there's a... yeah and there, it gets even deeper into this too. It, it, there's a there's a UBI component, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely share this. It's a Scientific American um, article. Yeah, they've done some good stuff with te with studies like this. One of the things, and it 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 under it's sort of like a broader, more simplistic experiment ex experiment, but it undersells some of the things that make the um di the the spread more stark. Like I'm thinking about the people that ran into some unlucky encounters, so they're they're now down at like five or whatever low success levels, and how how much harder it is to dig out of there just you know through the mechanisms of what they described, but also in reality, the less money you have, the more it costs to, to do basic things. Like you get fees for not having enough money in your bank account. Whereas if you're wealthy, you get interest on your income. Like money compounds itself and misfortune also compounds itself, which is more of a drag on the, uh, the income distribution over time, it makes it more in, unequal. This Italian team who did this modeling, like I loved how they went even further. That's that's already interesting what they discovered, but then they went even further and said, okay, like what if we introduce like funding opportunities into the situation? So then here's this table here where, um, you know, they tried different funding mechanisms. As the, this table reveals the most efficient funding strategies over the 40 year period into setting order of efficiency. Uh, starting at the top of the list, you can see that the least effective funding strategies are those that give a certain percentage of the funding 
to only the already most successful individuals. So what you don't want to do is, is, is let's say cut taxes on the rich. That's the absolute worst thing you can possibly do is to make sure that the rich uh, who are succeeding get even more resources. Well, if I'm, if I'm playing devil's advocate here, if someone who's like taking this seriously, one thing they have not built into their uh, algorithm is the trickle down mechanism to show how all these people at the bottom are going to get um, right. uplifted by all these talented people making jobs for them or something. The, the mixed strategies that combine giving a certain percentage to the most successful people and equally distributing the rest is a bit more effective and distributing funds at random is even more efficient. So it's actually kind of helpful to just randomly distribute money to people. This last finding is intriguing because it's consistent with other research suggesting in a complex social and economic context where chance is likely to play a role. Strategies that incorporate randomness can perform better than strategies based on the naively meritocratic approach. So it's kind of interesting that just randomly helping people can actually improve and make things more meritocratic. But here's where things get really interesting. The best funding strategy of them all was one where an equal number of funding was distributed to everyone. Distributing funds at a rate of one unit every five years resulted in the 60% of the most talented individuals having a greater than average level of success and distributing funds at a rate of five units every five years resulted in 100% of the most talented individuals having an impact. So that's like a UBI. That's just so fascinating really, to me. Yeah. It really facilitated a real meritocracy right. is to make sure that there's something to balance out the, the aspects of misfortune uh, that gives you a chance to try and try again and, and yeah. bring your talent. The researchers concluded that if the goal is to reward the most talented person, thus increasing their final level of success, it is much more convenient to distribute periodically, even small, equal amounts of capital to all individuals, rather than to give a greater capital only to a small percentage of them, selected through their level of success already reached at the moment of the distribution. And so, yeah, the, the reason this works so well, that this basic income and you know they weren't calling it that they they weren't testing basic income they were just like messing around with different you know funding strategies and it just resulted you know the the universal amount on a periodic basis had it is basic the best income. outcome <laughs> right and it's basic income no no target no targeting no conditions no anything right fully universal periodic and it, what it did is it, it basically neutralized the impact of, of bad luck. So if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you're highly talented and you have bad luck, then that can just destroy your ability to succeed. But if you have that floor, then you'll be able to, you know, get your, get back up again, wipe yourself up and keep going. And that's how to actually achieve this. Even a hundred percent meritocratic society was achieved by a high enough UBI. And it actually is reinforcing the meritocracy. Like the most talented person is actually be, being rewarded properly. Yeah. It's, that's uh, really, uh, to me, yeah, that's great. To me, another metaphor that I haven't used before actually occurs to me is like, it's like, um, if you're starting a fire, you're starting to, build a fire you don't know exactly where it's going to catch the best you know you have the tinder and the, like the things that you you have an idea but uh you know you start lighting the fires and then you feed it with oxygen and you don't aim the oxygen at certain things you just f try to get more oxygen flow to the fire in in general do we have a like the chat saying the link the chat saying the link in the chat oh, yeah. that uh scott needs to run for president with the policy of randomly <laughs> distribute money to people I mean, why not? Well, that wasn't <laughs> but the that randomly was, distribute. That wasn't the best one. It was, right, it was yeah. better than not doing anything. But yeah, yeah that was fully uh, universal was the best. I was watching it play out. They put that comment when you were still in that section. But then, you know, spoiler alert. We oh, found right. out that okay. actually UBI was even better. <laughs> yeah. Like that's one of those articles where, you know, I just, like, it was kind of like my jaw just hit the ground reading this because it wasn't about basic income. You know, the researchers weren't studying this. None of this was about basic income, but I saw it and I was like, that's basic income. Like that is, that yeah. improved this meritocratic outcome. How is it like 
we just watched a video about Brett Weinstein saying, you know, the danger of, of, you know, meritocracy being like upended by base income or whatever. And it's like, has he read this paper? Has he done any research into what actually, how meritocratic our system actually is and how it could be improved? Like, I doubt it. I think I he consulted his, have. I think he consulted his gut. Yeah. The, the thing that appeals to me too is like we were talking before about the politics of the thing and wokesters and whatever. And when I'm talking to people about basic income, it's pretty much presumed by especially people who are you know, anti that I'm a, like a bleeding heart, uh, naive liberal or whatever they, they, they want me to be. Or I believe in socialism, communism, all those things. And to me, what brought me in was the elegance of it from an engineering standpoint, the elegance of delivering the money that way, not wastefully, you know, the, like the sustainability of it. I like it as mechanism to keep capitalism from eating itself. I think, you know, capitalism plus, you know, s socialistic regulations to make sure that it doesn't, it doesn't cannibalize itself is, is a much smarter way to go forward than just, um, you know, naive, everyone deserves love sorts of, of policy. It, it actually is the mathematical mechanism that is the smartest if you run the numbers. In general, people have a hard time with randomness and luck being as big a factor as they are. Like factors and everything that's in, in that the universe works right like the pure randomness very, very little like laws or reason like governing how we're all kind of surviving and so like it's this kind of think it, it for me at least like addressing just sort of that factor like anything that can curtail that randomness in the right direction is something we need to do right but i think somebody like brett weinstein would look at that and like come up with a million reasons why the random ra randomness doesn't really exist that there are bigger reasons that are you know embedded in society embedded the way that we eat as humans that are actually responsible like and, and in the end it's because i'm smarter than you <laughs> like that's nothing <laughs> to do with randomness it has to do with the fact that i'm superior in many ways I, I like to think because there's so much uncertainty and nuance and chaos in such a big system with so many moving parts as as a you know a society it's like the stock market there's so much unpredictability i see uh i think it's interesting to think of ubi as like a, a great hedge so it's this big investment for in you know what you don't know what you can't predict right and it's basically investing in all of the potential sort of like unicorns out there that you know never got the funding they needed to to pay off right and it's acknowledging all the different ways in which we can be sort of deprived of these great things by a system that through no fault of their own or through misfortune or whatever can take the person who could bring that out of the running. Anyone who wants to go to itsafoundation.org, learn about what we're doing. This is a really powerful moment to help us keep the lights on as we uh, build commingle and finish bootstraps. Um, yeah, and if you don't know what those things are, then check out our previous episodes. <laughs> or go to or go to itsafoundation.org and it's got a little info. Uh, the headline is... We're trying to make basic income happen through the private sector, through sort of a crowdsourced UBI platform called Comingle. And the goal is to have 100,000 people getting a basic income within the first year. So help us out. Just wanted to, uh, I mean, I thought this was some pretty big news. And even though the Pope had already, you know, it was already big news when he first came out for, for universal basic income. And that was during... 2020 i think it was easter 2020 when he first expressed his support for it but he just did it again so i just want to make sure that people know that he just did it again he gave a long speech about um you know there's some stuff in bold here that wealth is made to be shared to create and promote fraternity without love we are nothing uh that greed is often asked by ideology that accumulation is not virtuous distribution is jesus did not accumulate he multiplied um he urged leaders to heed the cry of the excluded that uh true compassion builds unity in the beauty beauty for the world he uh, emphasized a call for love and uh, that without love none of this would make sense and this after this whole thing he in closing 
he uh, renewed his call for universal basic income to ensure that in the era of automation or artificial intelligence, no one is deprived of basic necessities. He emphasized that this is not just compassion, but strict justice. Definitely my favorite pope in my lifetime. <laughs> I saw something, I didn't look too deep, but I saw something about this on Twitter. And of course the comments were like how the pope is the antichrist or the pope is like <laughs> the biggest piece of shit out there it's like uh, it's it's just kind of funny yeah yeah i I had shared something earlier on uh like a couple weeks ago on twitter it was uh, an article on a on a, a christian a platform about how like they were like pastors were getting concerned about how like people were reacting to the words of jesus like the pastors up there talking about what jesus said and then people would come up to them afterwards and said like what are you doing? Like, that's, that's too weak. That's like communist bullshit. You know, like, is it, but these are the words of Jesus. It's like, yeah, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah. This is not Christian enough. I feel like whenever, whenever we saw this, this thing with UBI and I can go back to like writing screenplays and trying to be an actor, this idea that I've, I've, that's been rattling around in my head is like the second coming of Jesus and he comes back and you know, he was trying to flip the tables or maybe he starts a podcast or something, but all of the, uh, American evangelicals like tell him to go kick rocks like you know you pussy <laughs> like you got to earn it Jesus's podcast would be uh, and, and especially in YouTube and and would just be full of like horrible comments and like all his social media would just be horrific they'd be like oh no we lost Jesus he used to used to be someone we could count on be like you've, death threats to Jesus you've, you've gone woke and he's like but the eye of a needle and the camel and he's like no you can't take money from us <laughs> producers and job creators and right and he'd be like no 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 i'm just taking bread and i'm multiplying it so it's not coming from i'm not pulling bread from your pocket to make bread i'm make, i'm baking brand new bread to feed everybody like inflation you know, that's it <laughs> that's going to make everything cost more jesus if you just give more bread then all the rest of the bread is going <laughs> to right <laughs> You're no economist, Jesus. You can't just make bread. You can't just make wine. You can't just make fish. That leads to fish, wine, and bread inflation. What are you doing? All right. Well, have so, we uh, uh, have again? I think we're petering out. Yeah, I was hoping to get some news, but uh, we probably probably will not get some news here at the end. But um, you know, we'll, we'll that's a cliffhanger share it for our next episode. We'll let right. people know what happened. Right. <laughs> Come back next week. To yeah, find out right. Canada yeah, I, I, voted to keep a thinking to, to about expect that again. Canadian Parliament <laughs> is going to like make a fast decision, <laughs> thinking about w whether in two years they could start deciding whether they should read this report. <laughs> right. Yeah. I suggest turns, they should maybe read and write a report. Yeah. Turns out I, they debate this for the next ten hours today. Yeah. You know, it goes late into the night. I'm not going to. I don't know if we should. The whole thing. <laughs> I don't know if we should write this report or not, guys. No, we should write the report. No, we shouldn't. What's the budget? It's like it's less than we've spent talking about it for the last eight hours. This is just episode three, but this is fun. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And when this ends up on YouTube, you know, please like and subscribe and leave a reply. And we, uh, again, this is an unusual time. We usually try to do Wednesdays live at 12 p.m. Eastern. So hopefully it'll be next Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. And yeah, enjoy this on, on, on YouTube and our previous episodes uh, as well. 12 seconds later. One more example of the need for basic income.